Okay, so there was a few things I wanted to address. The f this presentation is going to be a little different uh, than what was on your bulletin uh, on the schedule. Uh, today, we're going to be placing the, today's presentation, the Order of Melchizedek, into the fifth presentation, and today we'll be dealing with the first fruits and the heavenly council. And what we would like to accomplish is we, we want to keep building a foundation on the previous presentations and kind of build and add a little more, add a little more, add a little more until we, we sort of see a great big picture. So, uh, as I told you before, the first presentation was for Passover, then the next one was for the Sabbath uh, of the first day of unleavened bread. And I kept it sort of going in that order. Uh, but because we had the day off on Passover, everything's a little bit behind. So we're going to look at first fruits today. And does everybody believe that first fruits comes on the 16th day of the month of Nisan? Yes? Yeah? Okay, because a lot of people, they believe that first fruits always must fall on a, on a Sunday. Uh, but we do have this statement in Desire of Ages Page 77, she says the Passover was followed by the seven days feast of unleavened bread. On the second day of the feast, the first fruits of the year's harvest, a sheaf of barley was presented before the Lord. So we do have that statement and so I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, Father, you are holy, holy, holy. Angels, they veil their face before your glory. And Father, who is like you? Father, you have created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and you have redeemed us with a strong arm. We want to thank you for our Passover lamb. We want to thank you that we can get the leaven out of our lives, leaven of sin, wickedness, malice. Father, I ask that you will do a thorough work in us of cleansing us and, and purging us from all defilement so that we can stand undefiled before you. And Father, I'm requesting that we can get, catch a glimpse of your throne today, that we can catch a glimpse of, uh, of the sanctuary and of its service and the, the wonderful things that you have for us in your word that oftentimes we read and we read and we read with because we don't have some pieces of understanding in place that we pass by. Grant us your spirit, we pray. And Father, grant me to be able to communicate simply, effectively, and to get the message out. And may you minister to each one according as he has need. And I thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, I want to say this, that uh, there was something that came to me the other day and uh, asked because of my first presentation, are you saying that we shouldn't preach against uh, meat? Because I, I had a bit of a statement uh, that sounded like I said, oh, they eat meat and we're okay. I, I, I want you to know that I absolutely unequivocally do not believe that we should be eating meat. Uh, I believe that in the world that we're living in right now, uh, just we need to be like Daniel, and we can't be we can't afford to allow our minds to be compromised by the food that we take in. And for those who do eat meat anyway, uh, I would I would I would venture to say that most people who do eat meat are not eating it kosher. They are still eating it with blood. Uh, so um, so if anyone has a problem with it, at least you should be eating kosher. And if you have to eat kosher meat, you're likely not going to eat as much meat as you were before. Uh, just, just want to put that out there, but I absolutely do not believe that we should eat meat, and I believe we need to be, uh, we need to be getting back to the way that the Creator designed us in the beginning. Um, all right, so with that off the table, uh, let's, let's begin. So last presentation we looked and we saw that we are in Adam. All men were created in Adam. All men were created in Adam's flesh. Uh, all the hosts of Adam were made when, when God fashioned and formed Adam on the sixth day. In like manner, 
on the sixth day when Christ was our Passover lamb, he took all men's sins upon the cross. He took us all. He endured us all upon the cross. All men were in Adam before they were ever born. All men were in Christ before he was risen from the dead as first born from the dead. When we were in Adam, only Adam had fellowship with God that first Sabbath day and Eve, of course. But Eve was in Adam. She came out of Adam. And, of course, all mankind comes out of Adam and comes out of Eve. Uh, so the Sabbath was, we get the root sa- word for Sabbath from the Hebrew Shabbat, which means an oath. It means a promise. The Sabbath is the divine promise. It's the divine pledge that we, ha- we were created by our Creator to have fellowship with God. And that that fellowship was hid in God from the foundations of the world. So it's a covenant that we were supposed to have. Likewise, being in Christ means that on the sixth day, all of our sins were laid upon him. And when he finished his work, his ministry, he ended it. All the work which he had created and he had made, then he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. And so the Sabbath is not just a a pledge that he is our creator and that he he wants to have fellowship with us, but it's also, also a pledge that he is our redeemer and has redeemed us and that he wants to have fellowship with us again. He wants to restore us into fellowship. And so Christ has become the second Adam through this work. That's what the scriptures say, uh, that when we are in Christ, he becomes the father, the re- representative of the human family. And it says in 1 Corinthians, it says this, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. So now we're going to the next day when he was risen. For since by man came death, that's Adam, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, if they believe. If they believe. Okay, what's going on? <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. It's, I think it's coming on and off. I think it's the batteries. Yeah. Uh, not good. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't make sense. But, but and it says, look. Yeah, you do. Uh, okay. Come on, come on. All right. Let's get into this. We got to give the loud cry. The only way we give a loud cry is if we actually, if people can hear you. <laughs> Please pray for Christian. All right. All right, did everybody hear me up till now? Okay, all right, as long as everybody hears me. I'm sure that the people over there didn't really hear me on, on the, the satellite, but um, everybody was in Adam in the flesh. All are to be in Christ, in the Spirit, if we believe. If we believe. If, not, not, just, not just an intellectual belief, but truly conforming to his death, that we might conform to his life. We are walking in in Christ. We have the faith of Jesus. We have fellowship in the faith by the obedience of faith. All right. This is a promise. This is the Shabbat. This is what every Sabbath is to mean with us, that we are to have fellowship in God through Christ. What a privilege. Now, he was the first fruits of them that slept. He was risen. Now it says that for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now notice, Christ is called the first fruits because he was the first risen from the dead. Now if we jump all the way to verse 44, it says this, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. But the last Adam was made a quickening, that is a life-giving spirit. So that's how we're born again, right? Men are born in Adam, and they're born in the flesh. 
but we're to be born of the Spirit so we can see the kingdom of God and we can know the things of the kingdom of God and the Father's righteousness can indwell us through the Spirit. Howbeit, it was not that which first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of earth. He's earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as we have borne, listen to this, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Oh, it's a wonderful promise. Wonderful promise. Now Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. When he was risen again, that was likened to the first day of creation. New creation. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. In Isaiah 65 verse 15, we're told this. We're told something. There's a, there's a prophecy. It says, and you shall leave your name as a curse for my chosen. Who is God's chosen? It's, it's Christ. He is his chosen. For the Lord shall slay you and call his servants by another name. What is being brought to view here by the prophet Isaiah is actually the experience of Jacob. Jacob left his name. He says, what's your name? And he says, Jacob. I'm a deceiver. And it was left as a curse. It was laid on Christ. And Christ gives him a new name, an overcomer. He slayed his old way, he slayed his old man, and he became a new man. Israel, he became a son, and he was called a servant. But more than a servant is a son, of course. And so we are privileged to recognize that in Christ, he has been made a curse and laid the curse out of the way so that he could restore the blessing to us. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There's not one spiritual blessing that we're lacking in Christ. But do we believe? Faith is the thing which takes hold of the unseen as though it already were. And so faith, if we have faith in Christ, we'll recognize that he is our death, he is our resurrection, he is our life, he is everything to us. And so we need, we need him. And so what's the conclusion of that? If the Lord God slays us, he slays the old man to call us by another name. Well, in Galatians 2 verse 20, it says this. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a beautiful promise. Now, Christ also said this about first fruits, and maybe you can, you can make the connection. John 12, verses 24 to 26. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it. And he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man shall serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. If any man serves me, him will my father honor. You see, Christ, he, he wants us to die with him so that we can bear much fruit. But because he has died, we are to be his fruit. We are to be as, uh, as sort of the first fruits, a kind of his creatures. But he is the first fruits, and then we are to be born again. All right, so the resurrection, he, Christ is the first fruits, and there is actually another type of first fruits which we're going to look at in a moment. Isaiah 26, verse 19, gives another prophecy. Isaiah's prophecies are full of messianic significance. It says, Your dead men shall live. With my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust." You, you sons of Adam, you that dwell in the flesh, made of dust, awake and sing, for your resurrection and life has risen. Christ is your life. He arose, and it was his dead body that arose and took all of humanity, the whole nature of humanity, on himself. When we recognize Christ in heavenly places, are we there with him? Are we communing with him? Do we have a representative in heavenly places? And again, Ephesians 2 verse 6 tells us that he has raised us up together and made us to sit together 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So again, in Christ is our life. And so we need the Spirit of Christ. We need the quickening Spirit that comes from the one who baptizes with the Spirit. So Romans 8 verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, that's the Spirit of the Father, dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, bring to life your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. All right. Now, what happened after Christ was risen? Where did he go? Do you know? Does anybody know? He went to the Father. But he actually went to the Father twice. And so, I want, I want us to look at that. But now, just as the priest, he had, before he would go into the sanctuary, he would slay the lamb, he would slay the sacrifice, then he'd be full of blood. Right? Can he go into the sanctuary full of blood? No. So what he would have to do is he would have to go to the, the laver and he would have to wash himself. Right? And so when you look at right before the sanctuary, right before the door, the priest would have to cleanse himself and all the marks of blood, all the marks of death would have to be taken off of them. Likewise, Christ. Uh, the, the laver is symbolic of the resurrection. The priest slays the sacrifice and he goes into the sanctuary. And so we're told in Titus 3 verse 5 what the washing symbolized. It says, Not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. That is coming to new life. That's resurrection. Being given new life and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So Christ, he was washed, he was regenerated, he came back to life. And did he come back to life with all of the, yes, he has his wounds, yes, he has the scars. But was he bloodied, beaten, battered? No, he came up with a glorified body, right? So he had to wash himself before he enters into the sanctuary. But if he goes into the sanctuary, we have to follow him there. You know, there's, we have... Many, many people today that profess Christ and they talk about the life, the death, the resurrection. That's good. That's glorious. But you know, many people don't know for 4,000 years what Christ was doing. They have no idea what he was doing until he came to earth. And then after he resurrected, it's, it's still worse still. They still, they have no idea what he did after he resurrected and he went to the Father. There's very, there's a, there's a great darkness, a great deep in the minds of those who profess to be Christians regarding the very one that they profess to believe in. They don't seem to understand. There's, there's a great ignorance on this question as to what Christ does and what he is doing today. We don't want that. And the prophecy is to be a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's supposed to tell us what, what he's doing for us. Now we're told in the book of Hebrews that he actually went into heaven. He went into the holy place. Now, some will say that he entered into the holiest, but when you look at the Greek, it's hagion. Hagion just means holy. But then there are some texts in the book of Hebrews that say hagion, hagion. It means the holy of holies. It's clear that Christ went into the holy place, the heavenly sanctuary that God had made. We'll look at that more in the fifth presentation. There's some really interesting things with this heavenly sanctuary for our instruction, and I think for our comfort. Now it tells us in Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 22, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw nigh with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What does that mean? What does it mean that he's, he's saying, listen, let's come into the veil, let's come into the sanctuary, but we can't do it without our bodies being washed with pure, we need something like baptism maybe, right? We need to be baptized into the death. We need to come up in resurrection. We need to be clean from the, the stains of sin wherewith we have slayed the Son of God. We need the washing of regeneration. That's for us. The labor is for us. We can't come into the sanctuary with polluted hands. 
And so there's so much significance at this time to say, wash yourselves, be cleansed, get the leaven out of your life. Let him take away your sin. This is what he wants to do for us. Now, there was another kind of first fruits. And they also experienced the resurrection to newness of life. They washed themselves with the labor of regeneration, or at least Christ washed them from the, the marks of death. In Matthew 27, verse 50 to 53, it tells us about this. It says, Jesus, once he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And they came out of their graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So this is a first fruits, right? First fruits. He, Christ himself was the first fruits from the dead, but also he takes a first fruits, just like the priest would wave a first fruits of the crop before God. Christ is going to, just as the seed, the grain had died in, in the earth, he comes up bringing a, a first fruits with him to present before the Father. Now in Desire of Ages, page 786. Uh, now, I know some of you are not so fond of Ellen White, but you know what? Uh, I, I believe that she's been given, and we don't need to explain our doctrine from Ellen White, but we should appreciate the, the revelations that were given to her to magnify uh, our understanding. She said if you read your Bible, you wouldn't need her writings. But I believe that her writings certainly do complement and sometimes give uh, a benefit to us that we, that we really need at this time. Desire of Ages... 786 says, As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. The earthquake at his death had rent open the graves. And when he arose, there they came forth with him. They were those who had been co laborers with God. Now look at look at what they had done. It says, And who, at the cost of their lives, had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised him, them from the dead. Notice that these were the martyrs who had existed, who had lived before Christ walked the earth. These were those who laid down their lives for the testimony of Jesus. So these were the ones who were privileged to wash the death marks off of them. Now, did Christ go up right away into heaven? No, we're actually told that he appeared to Mary first. The very one, the, one of the only ones that actually believed that he was going to his death. John 20, verse 17, when Mary comes and is so happy to see her Lord, Jesus said to her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. So he hasn't ascended yet. And that means that the first fruits haven't ascended yet, Right? And this is important. I want, you to, I want you to keep these points in your mind. The first fruits have not ascended into heaven until Christ himself ascends. But he says, But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. All right. So he had not yet ascended to his Father. Now I want, I want us to look at the throne that he was going to ascend to. And I want us to understand that there is a heavenly council that is very interested in the plan of salvation. And that it was to this heavenly council that Christ was to meet when he ascended. It's a very interesting subject, actually, this, this whole heavenly council thing. Um, and the scripture speaks enough about it that we can know. Of course, in Isaiah 6, it see, we see the throne of God, and seraphim are crying, holy, holy, holy. It's an awesome sight, but it's also very fearful. And Daniel 7, we see something similar. We see the throne of the Ancient of Days. And multitudes, tens of thousands times tens of thousands of angels are ministering before him. And in the book of Job, still yet, we see another glimpse of the throne. It tells us, and it gives us more details in Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now listen to this. It says, now there was a day. There was, there was a day. When the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where are you coming from? 
Did he not know where he was coming from? And who were these sons of God gathering on a certain day before the throne of God? Is it that there is a certain day? Is there a specific order in heaven where you have to come before God? You have to present yourselves Right, as maybe there's, there's a purpose for why he has his appointed times, his appointed assemblies. Right, there's a day when he gathers the sons of God, the heads of the unfallen worlds. Well, if you don't know that, we'll see that in a moment. So he says, Satan, where did you come from? Then Satan answered to him and said, from going forth to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. He's saying, it's my domain, you know, I, the earth is mine. Right? So uh, I have a perfect right to be here. Now, notice he's talking about the earth on a certain time, and he's gathering with the sons of God who are presenting themselves. What right does he have to be there? Well, uh, uh, one, one thing that this does tell us is that the sons of God do not always dwell in the presence of God, right? Because they, they assembled themselves at a certain time. But also, it tells us uh, that Adam was a son of God in Luke 3.38. Adam was the son of God. He was, he was the representative of this earth. Not that he was, uh, he was Christ himself. No, no. He was made by Christ. But he was the son of God of this world. And there were other sons of God. There were representatives of other planets. But Adam fell to Satan. Eve fell to Satan. They both fell to Satan. And so who is claiming the, the homage, the, the title... Uh, of, of the, the dominion of the earth. It's Satan, right? He's saying, listen, it's mine. Right? It's my right. All right, so these are the sons of God. These are, could it be that the sons of God were, were actually the representatives of the other planets that were gathering at the throne of God? I think so. Now we're going to look at another scene of the throne of God. Second Chronicles, verse 18, 18 to 21 we're revealed, this is where we, we see a council in heaven. This council is very important to the affairs that take place on the earth. Again, he said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, Yehovah. I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne and all the hosts of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. Now, this is all the hosts of heaven there, right before the throne. And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? So there was a judgment pronounced upon Ahab for his evils, for his wickedness. And one spoke after this manner and another after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, how? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall entice him, and you shall also prevail. Go out and, and do so. Notice that God had to give permission to deceive Ahab so that he would fall. Nothing was to touch Ahab without God's permission. Ahab was a king in Israel. Great events are determined in a council in heaven. That nothing, nothing great happens, no great event occurs without, without a council gathering in heavenly places. And so at the throne of God, we see this council taking place here. And who's coming out and saying, I'm going to be a lying spirit? Is this a holy angel? God forbid. Satan was not cast out until Christ ascended to be our representative, our son of God, before the heavenly universe. He became the son of God. He became the second Adam. And he took the place and he thrust Satan down. All claims to Satan's title to the dominion of the earth were lost. But this was Satan. And Satan said, I will, I will do it. Now in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, it tells us about the heavenly council. It says, in heavenly council, the angels pleaded with Lucifer. So there is a heavenly council. And they made a decision in this council that we need to go talk to Lucifer before he makes a shipwreck of his, of his soul. Story of Redemption, page 29. It says about an assembly that took place in heaven. It says, God assembled the angelic host to take measures to avert the threatened evil. It was decided in heaven's council for angels to visit Eden and to warn Adam that he was in danger from the foe. So notice, the council first pleads with Lucifer 
And when that fails, another council is assembled and held so that they can go warn Adam about what's taking place. So the angels go and they want to warn him. It says, two angels sped on their way to visit our first parents. So there's a heavenly council to make decisions in heaven. Now, Revelation 4 also reveals this heavenly council. Come with me to Revelation 4. Come on. Uh, take your Bible. We're going to go there. It's really an interesting chapter. Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 have so much to tell us about first fruits and Pentecost. Sometimes I think we need to read very, very closely, very, very carefully, because if we do, we're going to see that there are precious gems of truth that will give us an understanding so that the way that we read the scriptures with understanding is going to be much deeper and our communion, our fellowship in God is going to be much richer as a result. So my burden is that we would have an understanding and we would have wisdom and we would have knowledge so that when we read the scriptures that we're able to actually share with others what these things say, what these things mean. But there are deep things and we need to have an understanding. Okay, so what do we see in Revelation chapter 4? Well, in verse 1 it says, After this I looked and beheld, a door was open in heaven. It's interesting, there's doors in the sanctuary. You have the holy place and the most holy place. A lot of people believe that this is the door to the most holy place. But we'll see later that the evidence is not that, that's not the case. This is actually the door that's open into the holy place. This is right when Christ is about to ascend into heaven. When Christ has finished his work and he has been resurrected, he is about to come into through the veil, in through the heavenly gates. He says, so a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard like a trumpet talking with me said, come up here and I'll show you the things which must be hereafter. So there's events which are going to take place and that he's laying a foundation to show future events. He says, Immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one, not three, not even, it doesn't even say two here. It says one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look on like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne. Bear that in mind. There's a rainbow around the throne of God. And round about the throne, there were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed with white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. All right, who would these 24 elders be? Uh, we'll see a little bit today. We'll see a little bit tomorrow. But it's not, usually not what people think, because a lot of people say, well, the 24 elders are those who were raised with Christ, and they are the first fruits. And I, that's, a, that's an understandable conclusion to come to based on how, it's, how the text is translated in the King James. But many other translations, uh, you can't get that. And if you look at the manuscripts, you can't get that either. If you look at the ancient manuscripts, you will not find that a- at all except for maybe a few manuscripts. And you won't get the idea that these 24 elders could possibly be those who are risen at Christ's resurrection. So there are 24 elders, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So these are kings. And we're told, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps, that's candlestick, lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So it's interesting, he calls the, the, the candlesticks, the, and the fire that's burning thereon, the seven spirits. Seven spirits of God. Where do these spirits come from? Christ gives his spirit. He's a quickening spirit. And we'll see that in Revelation 5. So it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst it's a sea of glass. It's much like the sea that they would, the laver. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And then it describes the beasts. And what are the beasts doing? In verse Verse 8, it says, The four beasts had with them four, six wings about him. And these were full of eyes within and without. And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. These beasts are angels. These four beasts are four angels. Ezekiel talks in Ezekiel chapter 1 about the four cherubim. But the cherubim have four wings. But we know they're before the throne. But we also know that the seraphim that have six wings are before the throne as well. 
And we know that they cry, holy, holy, holy. But notice they're crying to one on the throne, not three. One. This is the Father. Now, up until now, have we, seen, have we seen the Lamb anywhere? Have we seen Christ anywhere in this vision? He's nowhere. He's nowhere to be found here. And it says, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne, who, uh, who liveth forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fell down before him which sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast down their crowns, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. And for your pleasure, they are and were created. So notice, they're giving homage to the creator of the universe. And their songs in heaven are purposeful. They don't just sing meaningless songs. And they don't just come and, and ad address God in any way. They recognize him as a creator. The members of the heavenly council sing a song of creation. And so... That, that's actually highly significant to the 24 elders because we're going to see that they're not among the redeemed. That, you might want to challenge me on that, and that's okay. But after. The 24 elders were not the first fruits. They were actually another company. I know some of you are probably just going through Revelation 5 and you're saying, well, there's a text here and a text here. But we'll get into that today and tomorrow. Now, they're rejoicing because God had created them and they're falling before the throne and they're, they're acknowledging His dominion, His creatorship. And so our song should be purposeful. That's one thing we need to do, especially if we want to join the heavenly council. Now, in Revelation 5 verse 9, they sing a new song. It's a different song. And so it's actually the same scene in Revelation 4 and 5. It's just giving more and more detail. But Revelation 5, we see the one sitting on the throne having a book with seven seals. And we don't see Christ appearing until verse 6 of that chapter. And then he just appears suddenly. He had just arrived at the throne as a lamb that had been slain, freshly slain. Now, as soon as he takes the, the scroll from the one that sat upon the throne, that's the Father, holy, 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 then we were told that the beasts, they fall down. And the 24 elders, they fall down. And they sing this new song together. Were the beasts ever redeemed? No? Were they? But look at the song in the King James. It says, For you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And have made us to our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Will angels ever reign on the earth? Do you know? I, people are, I'm not sure if people are with me. Will angels reign on the earth? No. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he has not subjected the world to come to angels. So there's something that seems to be a little strange here. Well, if you look in, only a few of the manuscripts have th things translated this way. Most translated it this way. Revelation 5, they're actually purposely singing about redemption because the Lamb has overcome. And they sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and did purchase unto God with your blood men of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and made them to be unto our God a kingdom of priests, and they shall reign on the earth. Could these be the sons of God? Could these be the ones that are assembling before the throne of God? Could it be that this is the heavenly council that has existed since Adam's fall? Ellen White has a quote that gives us more revelation on this. Desire of Age is a little lengthy, but I'm going to try and get through it. So stay with me and think on this scene. I really want you to meditate on it as I'm reading it. All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. As he ascended, he led the way, and the multitude of captives set free at his resurrection. Followed the heavenly hosts with shouts of acclamation of praise and celestial song attended the joyous train. As they drew near to the city of God, the challenge is given by the escorting angels. Lift up your head, O you gates, and lift ye up, you everlasting doors. So a door is opened in heaven. And the king of glory shall come in. 
And joyfully, the waiting sentinels respond, Who is this king of glory? This they say not because they don't know who he is, but because they would hear the answer of exalted praise, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Again is heard the challenge, who is this king of glory? For the angels never weary of hearing his name exalted. The escorting angels make reply, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Then the portals of the city of God are opened wide, and the angelic throng sweep through the gates amid a burst of rapturous music. There is a throne. Let's look at this. Let's look at what we see as soon as the door is open. There's a throne and a rainbow of promise about it. There is cherubim and seraphim. Sounds a lot like what we read in Revelation chapter 4. The commanders of the angel hosts, the sons of God, the representatives of the unfallen worlds are assembled. Notice the sons of God are there already. Could that be the 24 elders? The heavenly council before which Lucifer had accused God and his son. This is the council. The representatives of those sinless realms over which Satan had thought to establish his dominion are all there to welcome the Redeemer. They are eager to celebrate his triumph and to glorify their king. But he waves them back. Not yet. He cannot now receive the coronet of glory and the royal robe. He enters into the presence of his father. He points to his wounded head, his pierced side, his marred feet. He lifts his hands, bearing the prints of his nails. He points to the tokens of his triumph. He presents to God the wave sheaf. Those raised with him as representatives of the great multitude who shall come forth from the grave at his second coming. He approaches the father with whom there is joy over one sinner who repents, who rejoices over one with singing. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They clasped hands. They, cla- they had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ would become their surety for the human race. This pledge Christ has fulfilled. When Christ went upon the cross, he cried out, It is finished. He addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. All of his work was finished that he had made. Now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done your will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. If your justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom you have given me be there with me where I am. He wants us to be with him. So eagerly he takes his most dedicated, uh, dedicated amongst his fruit and he takes it before the Father and says, Look, these have suffered for my name. May they be glorified with me. The voice of God is proclaiming that justice is satisfied. There is a justice to be satisfied. Satan is vanquished. Christ's toiling, struggling ones on earth are accepted in the Beloved. Before the heavenly angels and the representatives of the unfallen worlds, notice that, the heavenly council, they are declared justified. Where he is, there his church shall be. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The Father's arm encircles his Son, and the word is given, let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1 verse 6. With joy unutterable, rulers and principalities and powers acknowledge the supremacy of the Prince of Heaven. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5, verse 12. So we we got into Revelation 4, Revelation 5. She's actually giving the very verses that the sons of God and the angels are singing. She just quoted that. This is the new song that they sing. Angels are singing this. It's not just angels, but sons of God. Songs of triumph mingle with the music of angelic harps till heaven seems to overflow with joy and praise. Love has conquered. The lost is found. 
Heaven rings with voices of lofty strains proclaiming blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Revelation 5 verse 13. Notice that this is when Christ ascended. This is when Christ went up that this song was sung. So therefore it's not the door to the most holy place but the door to the holy place that was opened. Now, what happened? I, 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 want, I want us to look at a few details here because it's, it's important to realize something about Christ and what he has done. He, he was the sacrifice and he was the priest. He is our death and he is our resurrection. To be a merciful and faithful high priest, he has to have an unblemished sin offering for the people. So Christ as a priest offered himself to be the victim. He was both priest and victim. We know that Christ ascended into heaven to offer the first fruits, but we know that he came back. We came, he came back down to earth and he returned to earth for around 40 days, instructing on the things of the kingdom of God to his disciples. Then we're told in Revelation 12 verse 5 that he is, he's caught up unto God and to his throne. Revelation gives us all the details here. And if we put the puzzles pieces in place, we will get a clear scene, a clear picture of what's going on so we can follow him there. And then the blood, of course, is accepted. In Revelation 12, verse 1, And I heard a loud voice saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That's when Satan was cast out. And if it is the case that the sons of God are the 24 elders, then, there was, then Satan was cast out and there was to be a 25th that was supposed to be there. And that's our high priest. That is the true son of God to be the representative of the people. But okay, so there was 40 days, but how many days from first fruits to Pentecost is there? There's 50. He's gone for... 40 days, and then all of a sudden, there's just 10 days where he just goes off the charts. He's off the map. Until Pentecost. And then Pentecost, we know that there was a sound of a great, uh, mighty rushing wind, and then, they, then the disciples speak with, the, with utterance of new tongues, and they, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. But there is some details. But we need to understand the law, and we under, need to understand that Christ is in the law. And the law will explain itself. It'll open up its precious sayings to us. And it'll, we'll see the messianic importance of it. In Exodus 7 verse 1, perhaps you remember when, when Moses didn't want to talk to Pharaoh just himself. And he said, well, okay, Moses is going to speak on your behalf. And the Lord said to Moses, see I have made you as God to Pharaoh. And Aaron your brother shall be your prophet, your anointed, your messenger. Now a question, if he's going as God, who is, who is Moses representing here? He's representing the Father. Who is the Father's prophet, his messenger to do all of his good pleasure? It's the priest or it's his son. So Moses and Aaron are revealing a picture of the Father and the Son. That's, that's, that's key. Let's keep that in our minds, okay? Now in Leviticus 8, we're... Actually, before I run ahead of myself, and I'm very tempted to run ahead of myself, uh, Revelation, or Daniel chapter 9, we, we looked at it the other day, right? That, that there was 70 weeks appointed, 490 years, to make an end of sin, to finish the transgression, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. But it also says, to anoint the most holy. And so if people say, see, see Christ, the day of atonement was finished at that, that time, all the atonement was done, but that would leave a huge problem because anyone who didn't repent went after the, the blood of uh, Christ anoints the mercy seat or the high priest anoints with the blood, they were cut off forever. There's no chance for repentance. The Jewish tradition, which I believe is correct based on what the Bible says, is that, I don't believe all Jewish tra tradition is correct, but it says that they would be blotted out of the book of life if they did not repent. And that's a, Absolutely correct. And so, this is, that must be a different anointing that needs to take place within the 490 years when Christ ascends. Something has to happen to anoint 
the sanctuary in heaven. After Christ's sacrifice is accepted, he comes and he presents the first fruit offerings and says, accept them, Father. And he accepts them as his own. They will be there with him where the Father is. But then the sanctuary has to, in, in a special way, have an inauguration. And so we see the inauguration of the earthly sanctuary, which is a pattern of the heavenly sanctuary, and a certain, uh, a certain amount of significant events take place. And this, remember, Moses as the father, Aaron as Christ, as Yeshua. Leviticus 8, verses 6 to 13, it says this. It says, Moses brought Aaron and his sons, and he washed them with water. Now remember that. What was the washing of the water symbolic of? It was, well, it was a baptism, Red Sea, okay, you could say that. But also, it's the, the labor, the washing of regeneration, the resurrection, right? Before you can go into the sanctuary, you need to be washed with water. And so, notice, Moses washes Aaron and his sons with water. You know who, who raised up uh, Christ from the dead? It says that he was raised up by the Spirit of the Father. And that the Father raised him up. That's interesting. Okay, so Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Here is Aaron and his sons, Christ and his first fruits. And he put on, upon him the coat and girded him with a girdle and clothed him with a robe and put an ephod on him. And he girded him with his curious girdle of the ephod and bound it up unto him therewith. And he put the breastplate upon him. Now the breastplate was called the breastplate of judgment and it had the 12 stones of the tribes of Israel. 12 stones. Christ is going into heaven. Could it be that the Father is girding him for his priestly work in the heavenly places? Absolutely. Because this is the inauguration of the earthly, which is a shadow of the heavenly. So the Father is, is putting in preparation in place all these things. But you know what? There was only 11 disciples. There's only 11 apostles. They need to choose a 12 for the apostleship. And so this is required. This has to happen before the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And seemingly they knew it. Because Christ instructed them on the kingdom of God. So once the 12 comes, once he has the full breastplate in place, then he offers before the Father. He says, these are my messengers. These are my apostles. And it says he put the mitre upon his head. Moses puts it on Aaron. And even upon his forefront. He put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. No, there's, it, Lord's just, Yah is not just commanding Moses for just arbitrary reasons. He knows that this is what he's going to do for his son. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that is therein and sanctified them. It's exactly what we see with the anointing of the Most Holy in the 70-week prophecy. Christ had to do it before 34 AD. He had to. He had to anoint the sanctuary with oil. But not only was the sanctuary anointed with oil, and it says he sprinkled thereof on the altar seven times. We're going to go back to that in a later presentation. And anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the laver and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured out the anointing oil upon Aaron's head. This is, this is, oh, I'm just, I'm just trying to contain myself. This is, I like this a lot. The anointing oil was upon Aaron's head and he anointed him to sanctify him. And then Moses brings Aaron's sons and puts coats upon them and girds them with girdles and puts bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. What picture does this give us? Christ is given all power in heaven and in earth, of course, and he is given the Spirit so that he might give the Spirit or the oil, the same oil that will go into the, the candlesticks. He, he puts it into, uh, which the priest is responsible for putting it into the candlesticks, the candlesticks, which are not lit. <laughs> Hopefully our candles are lit. Hopefully we have the oil in our vessel. The anointing oil was upon Aaron's head. 
anointed and sanctified him. But what is the father doing here after he, he gives this to Christ? He, he restores to him the glory which he had with his father before the world was. He takes Aaron's sons, the first fruits, and he puts coats upon them. They're going to be officiating as priests. The first fruits say, come up into heaven. And the father himself greets the first fruits and he clothes them with their fine linen, the righteousness of the saints. They're now to officiate before the throne of God because they officiated on earth. And they were like the lamb that was slain. They revealed the lamb that was slain. And now they were to do another work in the sanctuary. And they have a very important work, but again, fourth and fifth presentation. So he brought them, put coats on them, girded them with girdles, put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, <laughs> here's something very interesting. Psalm 30, 133. It's called the Song of Ascent. Do you know what the Song of Ascents were? The Song of Ascent was when they would travel up to Jerusalem, to wherever the feast was, and they would ascend together and they would sing psalms. And so as uh, they would sing one specific song of ascent on Pentecost. There might have been others, but I know that this one was on Pentecost. A song of ascent of David. Now listen to it. It was on Pentecost. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Be of one accord. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down upon his skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You see, are you getting the connection? Is everybody with me? The oil... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm finishing up. I got two things. The oil that was on Aaron's, that w when he was anointed, when he went into the sanctuary, when all the pieces of the sanctuary were anointed, are likened to brethren dwelling together in unity. And it comes down upon the people, upon Mount Zion, everlasting life. And so what do we see in Acts 2, verses 1 to 4? It says, on the day of when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place. How pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And suddenly there came the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right. So, when Christ was anointed in heaven, what we see is that, that we were anointed. It was, it was signifying that the anointing, the service, the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary, that's what Pentecost is all about, and that's what we're looking forward to and we're counting down to, is commemorating the heavenly sanctuary and its inauguration and the giving of of the Holy Spirit in a large measure. And so what did Aaron and Moses do? They come out of the sanctuary and it says, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and when they came out, they blessed the people, which is symbolic of the apostles. And what happens? The glory of the Lord appeared unto the people and there came out fire from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar and the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw, they shouted and fell upon their faces. I want you to think about that for a moment. That the fire descended out of heaven and it came upon them just like on Pentecost. Just like when, Moses, uh, when Solomon had consecrated the temple with its priesthood and then he offers a prayer, the inaugural prayer, like Christ himself. Moses, Solomon is called the Son of God in the scriptures. And then the fire comes down and consumes the burnt sacrifice. Can you, can you see the parallels here? Can you see what, what first fruits is significant of and what it's bringing us to? And are we following our Messiah? This is only, we only followed him a little bit. We've only seen what he does up until Pentecost. But we want to go much further than this.